Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. So, let's get going. Chapter 21 Ben Weatherstaff One of the strange things about living in the world is that it is only now and then one is quite sure one is going to live forever and ever and ever. One knows it sometimes when one gets up at the tender solemn dawn time and goes out and stands alone and throws one's head far back and looks up and up and watches the pale sky slowly changing and flushing and marvellous unknown things happening until the east almost makes one cry out and one's heart stands still at the strange unchanging majesty of the rising sun which has been happening every morning for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. One knows it then for a moment or so, and one knows it sometimes when one stands by oneself in a wood at sunset, and the mysterious deep gold stillness, slanting through and under the branches, seems to be saying slowly again and again something one cannot quite hear, however one much tries. Then sometimes the immense quiet of the dark blue at night, with millions of stars waiting and watching, makes one sure, and sometimes the sound of a far-off music makes it true, and sometimes a look in someone's eyes. And it was like that with Colin, when he first saw and heard and felt the springtime inside the four high walls of a hidden garden. That afternoon, the whole world seemed to devote itself to being perfect and radiantly beautiful and kind to one boy. Perhaps out of pure heavenly goodness, the spring came and crowned everything it possibly could into that w one place. More than once Dickon paused in what he was doing and stood still with a sort of growing wonder in his eyes, shaking his head softly. Eh, hey, it is gravely, he said. I'm twelve going on thirteen, and there's a lot of afternoons in thirteen years, but seems to me like I never seed one as gradely as this year. Aye, it is a gradely one, said Mary, and she sighed for mere joy. I warrant it's the gradialist one as ever was in this world. Does the think, said Colin with dreamy carefulness, as happen it was made like this year all a purpose for me. My word, cried Mary admiringly, that there is a bit of good Yorkshire, thou art shaping first rate, that thou art. And delight reigned. They drew the chair under the plum tree, which was snow white with blossoms and musical with bees. It was like a king's canopy, a fairy king's. There were flowering cherry trees near, and apple trees whose buds were pink and white, and here and there one had burst wa open wide. Between the blossoming branches of the canopy, bits of blue sky looked down like wonderful eyes. Mary and Dickon worked a little here and there, and Colin watched them. They brought him things to look at, buds which were opening, buds which were tight closed, bits of twig whose leaves were just showing green, the feather of a woodpecker which had dropped on the grass, the empty shell of some bird early hatched. Dickon pushed the chair slowly round and round the garden, stopping every other moment to let him look at wonders springing out of the earth or trailing down from trees. It was like being taken in state round the country of a magic king and queen and shown all the mysterious riches it contained. I wonder if we shall see the robin, said Colin. They'll see him often you know, after a bit, answered Dickon. When the egg hatches out, the little chap, uh, he'll be kept so busy it'll make his head swim. They'll see him flying backward and forward, carrying worms nigh as big as himself, and that much noise going on in nest when he gets there, as fair flusters him, so as he scarce knows which big mouth to drop the first piece in, and gaping beaks and squawks on every side. Mother says, as when she sees w the worker Robin has to keep them gaping beaks filled, she feels like she was a lady with nothing to do. She says she see she, uh, 
She says she's seen little chaps when it seemed like sweat must be dropping off them, though folk can't see it. This made them giggle so delightedly that they were obliged to cover their mouths with their hands, remembering that they must not be heard. Colin had been instructed as to the law of whispers and low voices several days before. He liked the mysteriousness of it and did his best, but in the midst of excitement and enjoyment, it is rather difficult never to laugh above a whisper. Every moment of the afternoon was full of new things and every hour the sunshine grew more golden. The wheeled chair had been drawn back under the canopy and Dickon had sat down on the grass and had just drawn out his pipe when Colin saw something he had not time to notice before. That's a very old tree over there, isn't it? he said. Dickon looked across the grass at the tree and Mary looked and there was a brief moment of stillness. Yes, answered Dickon after it and his low voice had a very gentle sound. Mary gazed at the tree and thought. The branches are quite grey and there's not a single leaf anywhere, Colin went on. It's quite dead, isn't it? Aye, admitted Dickon, but them roses as has climbed all over it will near hide every bit of the dead wood when they're full of leaves and flowers. It won't look dead then. It'll be prettiest of all. Mary still gazed at the tree and thought. It looks as if a big branch had been broken off, said Colin. I wonder how it was done. <clears throat> it's been done many a year, he answered Dickon. Eh, hey, with a sudden relieved start and laying his hand on Colin. Look at that robin. There he is. He's been foraging for his mate. Colin was almost too late, but he just caught sight of him. The flash of red-breasted bird with something in his beak. He darted through the greenness and into the close-grown corner, and was out of sight. Colin leaned back on his cushion again, laughing a little. He's taking her tea to her. Perhaps it's five o'clock. I think I'd like my, some tea myself. And so they were safe. It was magic which sent the robin, said Mary secretly to Dickon afterward. I know it was magic. For both she and Dickon had been afraid Colin might ask something about the tree whose branch had broken off ten years ago, and they had talked it over together, and Dickon had stood and rubbed his head in a troubled way. We mun look as if it wasn't no different from other trees, he said. He had said. We couldn't never tell him how it broke, poor lad. If he says anything about it, we mun. We mun try to look cheerful. Aye, that we mun, had answered Mary. I was a bit disjointed. But she had not felt as if she looked cheerful when she gazed at the tree. She wondered and wondered in those few moments if there were any reality in that other thing Dickon had said. He had gone on rubbing his rust-red hair in a puzzled way, but a nice comforted look had begun to grow in his blue eyes. Mrs Craven was a very lovely young lady. He had gone on rather hesitatingly. A mother, she thinks... Maybe she's about Misselthwaite many a time, looking after Mester Colin, same as all mothers do when they're out, when they're took out of the world. They have to come back, the seas. Hap happen she's been in the garden, and happen it was her uh, set us to work and told us to bring him here. Mary had thought he meant something about magic. She was a great believer in magic. She, secretly, she quite believed that Dickon worked magic. Of course, good magic, on everything near him, and that that was why people liked him so much, and while creatures knew he was their friend. She wondered, indeed, if it were not possible that his gift had brought the robin just at the right moment, when Colin asked that dangerous question. She felt that his magic was working all the afternoon, and making Colin look like an entirely different boy. It did not seem possible that he could be the crazy creature who had screamed and beaten and bitten his pillow. Even his ivory whiteness seemed to change. The faint glow of colour, which had shone on his face and neck and hands when he first got inside the garden, really never quite died away. He looked as if he were made of flesh instead of ivory or wax. They saw the robin carry food to his mate two or three times, and it was so suggestive of afternoon tea that Colin felt they must have some. 
And with that, we come to the end of the episode. Um, so, as per usual, I will say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.